This What's Working with Cam Marston podcast is brought to you courtesy of Michelob Ultra Beer. They say consistency is the key to success. They weren't wrong. So how about grabbing a beer that's consistently smooth, consistently refreshing, and consistently light? You might just find that the road to success can be pretty enjoyable. Michelob Ultra, the perfect balance of taste and refreshment and only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Enjoy responsibly. Anheuser-Busch Michelob Ultra Light Beer, St. Louis, Missouri. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. What's Working is the show designed to bring you workplace, workforce, and marketplace trends that are shaping the workplace, the workforce, and the marketplace around us. I try to find guests who have insights into things that are going on in the workplace, the workforce, or the marketplace, that when we hear them talk about it, we can change our home behaviors and maybe get a little bit better at whatever it is that we do. Thank you so much for joining along on the ride for this show. And again, Happy New Year. We're now in the sixth year of the show, and while you look at six years and to some radio shows, it's just a blip in time. It's longer than I ever thought we'd do this, and I have to say I continue to enjoy it more and more, and the temptation as you begin the sixth year is to want to look back. However, I think we should be beginning the show by looking forward, and we'll do that real quick with my aspirations for the show in the year. My hope is to continue to grow it, to continue to have guests that can really in a fun and entertaining and educational way, talk to us about the trends influencing their business. And we can utilize those trends, like I said a moment ago, to help our own businesses. I also want to begin to continue the expansion of the show. As we talk right now, we're in six markets. By this time next year, I'd like to add at least another three or four markets to it. And we have designs for that growth. The intention is to make this one of the go-to business shows in your radio listening world or in your podcast download. You can find more about the show at whatsworkingcam.com, and we'll be continuing to enhance that site throughout the year as well. The second area I want to look forward into this year is our economy. The 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 signs, the newscasters, the economists, etc., are all predicting recession. And when uh, 20, let's say 12 months ago, most were saying we would not see a recession. Their tone has changed and they're predicting a recession. And I think it's important that we look forward and think, what does this recession mean to each of us, mean to our businesses? And are there strategies we should take to mitigate against what the recession can do to us? There's no better person in my Rolodex to ask than my friend Peter Raschuti. You'll remember that Peter if you're a fan of the show, is the business professor at the A.B. Freeman School of Business at Tulane University. He has his students, as a part of their graduate degree process, uh, go and study these organizations, these small companies. He calls them stocks under rocks. And by interacting with these CEOs of these companies, these students gain a remarkable background into uh, how, to, how the business process works, makes them better uh, business analysts and things of that nature. But it also collects a lot of data from a lot of organizations that can give us a read of the tea leaves, if you will. So I'm going to get Peter on the phone here momentarily. We're going to talk about what he sees in the future, what his uh, Birkin Road companies see in the future. We'll also talk about Birkin Road, what exactly is Birkin Road and why should you be aware of what that is and who is involved in it. And then I think perhaps as importantly is are there strategies that we as small businesses can take or medium or large size businesses can take during times of pending recession that will help us out while others are struggling or living in fear? What can you and I be doing in this time that will advance us so that on the other side of any recession, whatever it is, we are positioned to excel, to achieve, to grow, whatever it is. So. Let's begin the new year that way. Again, thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. When we come back, I'll be on the line with one of the more entertaining guests we have, Peter Raschuti. Be right back. (music) 
I'd like you to meet my new sponsor, Get the Tea. They carry all natural, non-GMO, organic herbal cleansing teas and supplements. They source their ingredients from the purest available. Your health is an investment that's worthwhile, so why wait? I drink their tea each and every day to help keep my digestive system in check. I'm drinking the glass as I record this right now. It comes in three flavors, natural, peppermint, and pomegranate. I'm drinking the peppermint. All of their products are made right here in the USA. Go to getthetea.com and enter code CAM5, that's C-A-M-5, to receive $5 off your first order. That's getthetea.com, code CAM5. This is Trey Langus with Transworld Business Advisors. I help business owners sell their businesses from mom and pop size to large mergers and acquisitions. We have a huge buyer database looking for quality businesses to buy right now. Confidentiality guaranteed. If you're a business owner considering an exit within the next few years, let's talk. Again, I'm Trey Langus. Find me at Transworld Business Advisors or Google my name. On the line with me is Peter Raschuti. If you're a fan of the show, you certainly know that name. I think, Peter, this is maybe your third and perhaps even fourth time on the show. He is our favorite economist. And when I say the words interesting, humorous, fun economist, it often sounds like a contradiction of terminology, not with Peter Raschuti. Peter, thank you so much for your time. Welcome back to What's Working. Oh, thanks. I want to be known as a friend of the show. Oh, <laughs> with a small <laughs> payment? There's no problem with that. In fact, I'll put your name on the website. It's nothing money Please won't do. solve. <laughs> so, Peter, in my own business, see, you know, I've got the, the radio show, obviously, but I've got this seminar business, as you know, and this keynote speaking yeah. business, which I know you're a part of. I'm seeing right. a little bit of contraction out there in my clients due to fear of the economy. They're, they're taking their... They're hedging their bets. They're getting more conservative. And I'm certain the listeners across the state of Alabama are experiencing these things, too. Tell me, Peter, what's going on out there? Help us understand the the, the landscape today. Well, first of all, I, I guess maybe because we both do this partially for a living, but um, this is really the wrong time to cut back on that kind of thing. This is when people need a little pumping up about the way you know, about their business. And, you know, and, and really, when you look at it, most companies if you look at the ones that really do well, they it's what they do during the down times. Uh, the companies that don't do as well coming out are the ones that, you know, just go hide and the other ones pick up uh, the advantages and pick up market share. So um, they probably shouldn't, uh, shouldn't cut back on this, but you know, you're getting a lot of news, uh, financial news, and it's uh, it tends to skew negative where actually it's kind of, um, uh, you know, I, it's, it's what, uh, what Jerome Powell's trying to do is create this kind of Goldilocks economy where he's, um, and you remember, it did not work out for Goldilocks. She, you know, got her butt thrown back out of that cabin. So, yeah. um, but that's, yeah. So, but so maybe not a good analogy, but he, um, he's trying to come down a pathway, a very narrow pathway where we don't go into a recession or if we do, it's a mild recession and we still bring down inflation. And I think he's doing it. You know, so many people are against the Fed, but, you know, we've had inflation levels every month drop since since April when it peaked at 9.1. So it's moving down. It's not um, may not, you know, be, uh, you know, very quickly, but it's moving down. It's in the right direction. And the economy's holding up. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of fear out there. But you look at the job numbers and they're terrific, you know, in fact. And so what happens is nobody's ever happy if the um, if the economy shows signs of uh, being strong. People say, oh, my God, that's terrible. We're going to have inflation. And then if it uh, and, you know, and then if you uh, go the other way, um, you know, if, it, if we start to see a weaker uh, numbers coming out of the government and all that, people say, oh, we're going into a recession. So it's a no win, uh, no win situation for um for Jerome Powell and the Fed. But I think, 
you know, people want to, you know, complain about him. But if he gets us through this little pathway, I mean, there ought to be statues of him in every city. Yeah. So. yeah. And, uh, so the levers, a, a couple things that I want to touch on that you've already said. Number one, it's during, during times of uh, recession or perceived recession that the aggressive companies out there step forward. They say others are pulling back. This is an opportunity for us to gain market share, to elevate our brand, whatever it may be. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and it's a hard thing to do because, uh, you know, the news is just coming at you right. and coming at you. But there's not a single news story that everybody's going to say, wow, this is great. Yeah, so yeah that's not. a good point. And the levers oh. that Jerome Powell is pulling. Now, l- let me let me preface something here and I want your opinion on it and then talk about the levers. It seems to me and perhaps I've read this somewhere. This is fairly intuitive or, or fairly uh uh, intelligent, what I'm about to say, which makes me think it's certainly not original to me. But the Fed <laughs> looks backwards in making decisions. They look at reports about things that have happened in the past, and the stock market looks forward about what they think is coming. So right now, we're looking at high inflation from the Fed, and we're looking right. at low stock market from uh, or low pricing or whatever it's described from the stock market. Am I right on these two, the way these two uh, systems work? One looks back and one looks forward. And then what are the levers the Fed has? What are they using to help us out? I know it's interest rates, but are there things that I'm not aware of? Oh, no, that's um, that you're absolutely right. And the the stock market is a great leading economic indicator. It's usually about six to nine months ahead. You know, you remember back in 09, kind of the end of the world and the financial crisis, the economy didn't get really start to get any traction till the middle of 2010. And the stock market uh, took off in in the summer of 09. So it is always kind of a leading economic indicator. Uh, the, the Fed is looking at trying to look at uh, leading at, uh, economic indicators and there are things they think will uh, will result in something six to nine months uh, uh, forward. And, you know, one of the things about the Fed is they got a lot of uh, a lot of criticism for only raising interest rates in the beginning of 2022. And maybe they didn't, they didn't see this and why didn't they see this? But the truth is they started raising interest rates uh, in early 2022, but they started turning the le- moving the levers in the middle of 2021 because the Fed, um, the Fed can do a lot of things. And what they started in the middle of 2021 was they started not raising interest rates, but um, it's a little, it seems a little esoteric, but selling securities into the market so that it would absorb money, so that it would slow down the economy. And that's their first lever. And they did it. And, you know, if the argument, I guess, would be that, um, you know, maybe they didn't, uh, six months later, they didn't raise interest rates uh, sooner or something like that. But it wasn't like they were just sitting on their hands. Um, you could see this coming. The other thing, you know, I mean, it's incredible. An average economic expansion lasts between five and seven years if you go back forever. Um, and this expansion that we just came out of is um, is 12 years old. Yeah. So, I mean, even, yeah, I mean, if, if anything else, it was just long in the tooth. So, um, but, you know, a, a couple of things, um, Cam, that I always think of is – since 1928, um, in terms of having two bad years in the stock market in a row, it's only happened four times. Mm-hmm. So, so the market is is taken into account um, a lot of the the, the bad news uh, going forward. And um, I think the mar- uh, you know, certain stocks uh, look expensive, but overall the market looks pretty cheap. I think one of the things that people are seeing is all the stocks that did so well for the last eight years, um, you know, the high tech things, yeah. all of that. And, um, those got clobbered and maybe, maybe they needed to be clobbered, right. you know, it's, um, so we'll have to have to see. So are there, what are the, what are the figures, Peter, that you rely on the most to understand the economy? And I, I'm curious if, if you're sitting in front of your computer when they announce that the new unemployment numbers will be released at 8 a.m. or something like that, uh, what are the numbers that you keep an eye on the most that you feel gives you insight into where we're going? You know, I uh, actually um, care about the uh, the stock and bond markets because one of the things is those newscasters and God, we're in amazing problem in terms of misinformation but those newscasters and those politicians they've got an axe to grind every single one of them and the markets don't have an axe to grind Mm -hmm. this is people just placing their bets so 
they it's some they don't care about anything um, other than the fact of am I right about these these movements in the economy that are going to drive the stock market? And I just feel a lot better about them, you know, that they uh, uh, that that these are the actions they're taking, and I think that's good. And one thing that does kind of frighten people is what's called the inverted yield curve. Like yeah. right now, yeah, you've got short term rates higher than long term rates, and that historically has said the economy was about to slow down. But the funniest thing is it is, it is predicted 15 of the last seven recessions. So they, um, it's, it's a little, there is a, there is a false positive thing. So yeah, but a pretty good index. I think anybody, uh, when I hear inverted yield curve, and I know very little about these things, but I hear inverted yield, yield curve. It's usually people talking about doom and gloom around the corner. And right. uh, it sounds like a, a catastrophic event. It's inverted. The yield curve is inver- inverted. I don't think most people that use that term completely understand what it means or that phrase understand what it means other than oh this can't be good the yield curve is inverted so you said right. a moment ago that the stock market remind me is a predictor of six to eight months down the road is that right right that's right so what is the stock market saying six to what's going to happen six to eight months down the road if we're still so low well i think a couple of things you know we we had a good bounce the uh the stock market got down to 3,600 in the summer, and then interest rates were about five and a quarter percent. And here we are, um, six months later, and the stock market is up a little. It's at 3,800, so it's made a little bit of a bounce, and um, and interest rates have come down a lot. You know, from five and a quarter to about 3.8 percent. So right. the panic we saw in the summer seems to have um, uh, been gone, and I think that's. Um, I think that's what's really, uh, really important in here. So we'll we'll have to see. I mean, um, it just doesn't seem like anything will please investors or anything will will please uh, um, please people looking at the um, looking at the economy. But you know, it's funny. <laughs> this is Cam. Somebody, a lot of people have said this to me, and they're thinking, you know, could we worry ourselves into a recession? Yeah, and I think we could. <laughs> the, our only enemy is fear itself, or something like that. Yes, there was a guy that said that. There was yes. a guy that said that, and I, and I think you're right. If <laughs> If we if we continually think that the future is going to be bad, we're going to make it bad. And I think that gets yeah. into a, a society's attitude. And, you know, I wish we could whisper in the ear of the news commentators to, hey, stop spelling doom and gloom. And maybe we won't see doom and gloom. Yeah, I think it sells better. For it some does reason. sell bad better. News, uh, yeah, bad news sells. Uh, we need to go to break, Peter. When we come back, I'd love to hear more about what small business or a medium size or large business. Maybe we can get into some tactics of what to do when your competitors are afraid. How's that sound? That sounds great. We'll see what we can make out of that. You're listening to What's Working on the Line with Peter Rusciutti. Peter is the, oh, I've written it down, Clinical Professor of Business Administration and Assistant Dean at the A.B. Freeman School of Business at Tulane. Roll wave. We'll be right back. You're in business to make money. At United Bank, we're in business to help you manage it. We offer a full line of financial solutions, including business credit cards, business checking, merchant services, and more. We'll work with you to create a bundle of services that fits your business needs. Learn more about how we can help your business grow at unitedbank.com cam. Member FDIC, credit card subject to credit approval. Customer service never goes out of style. In fact, I think it's safe to say that customer service is more valuable and more important now more than ever. Hi, this is Cam Marston. One thing that my over 200 episodes of What's Working has taught me is how important customer service is to building and maintaining a thriving business. It's the growing need for customer service that's led me to partner with one of the state's leading customer service trainers to create our program called Delivering Five Star Customer Service. Your team will get one 90-minute training session per month for six consecutive months. Each session builds on the skills learned the previous month, allowing your customer-facing teams to practice before moving on to the next lesson. And the six lessons address everything from appearance to electronic communications to conflict resolution to maintaining a service mindset. 
Our program travels and is delivered in person at your workplace. Nothing virtual. You simply can't practice the level of the skills this course teaches virtually. For more information, email me, cam at cammarston.com, and let's schedule a time to talk. Remember, you have less to fear from outside competition than you do from discourtesy and bad service from inside your own company. Again, email me, cam at cammarston.com, and let's talk about your business. Peter Raschuti is on the line with me. Let me read you a couple of the organization or the, the media that he's been featured in. I'm looking, Peter, at your website here. The Wall Street Journal, Wall Street Week, CNBC, The Financial Times, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Fortune, Boston Globe. Perhaps you've heard of some of these. He's the clinical professor of business administration at the Freeman School of Business at Tulane University and a repeat guest on the show. Peter Prior to the break, we were talking a little bit about things that small business or business can do, and then we're going to get into some other things. When they think their competitors are afraid, when they think their competitors are contracting, what are some top of mind things that they can do to try to gain market share? I know that you study these companies through your Birkin Road reports, which we'll talk about in the next segment. What are some top three things they should do when they think their competitors are afraid? Well, Cam, we have to get to the most important issue, and that is Tulane won the Cotton Bowl. That's yes. the most important, <laughs> important can... thing. Now, for their listeners in Alabama, this is just, you know, just another year of great. We've never been good. No, <laughs> so <is> no. A... <laughs> so, our, so you can see why we're basking. <laughs> I saw so many people, friends of mine, were posting things that Tulane is now a football school. And I'm like, hey, now, <laughs> hey, <laughs> okay. one flash in we the pan does not make us a football school. Let's be careful right, here. Right. And, you know, for the Alabama people out there, we one of the things, OK, we're putting together a great team on the field, but we don't know how to tailgate yet. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they can help us. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. I was there for the conference championship and I saw you there and I walked around that campus going, this is just fantastic that these people are behaving this way. This looks wonderful oh, to me. I, I know they have, there was a funny line um, on ESPN the day. And obviously it was a joke, but they said uh, uh, Tulane uh, showed USC just what uh, fine dining partying and uh, education could do. So it was something. Um, <laughs> Choose sure our lifestyle. Not brochure. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Just the lifestyle. But getting back to the, the real question, um, I think one thing you've got to know is that nobody, nobody, nobody ever can time the market or time the economy on a consistent basis. It just doesn't happen. If you look at people like Warren Buffett, you know, they're buying stocks for the long run and long run, they might mean forever, uh, the, these, these kind of companies. So the, lo the long term projection on the economy and the stock market is up. It always has been up. Yeah. And uh, effectively, there's a graph that everybody shows, which is showing that, you know, whether it's World War II or the Korean War or Watergate or whatever, they become little bumps. But the, the long term projection is up because um, that's the way uh, capitalism works. You get these, you get these little downturns that refresh things, and um, and then it comes back up. So it's tough to bet against the uh, the stock market or bet against capitalism or democracy. All these things have uh, been very very strong. But I think what a business owner uh, needs to yeah. remember is that um, yeah, that you can't um, you you really. You can't pull your pull your horns in too much, even if you're convinced uh, things are going to get very bad. Now, you might say, I don't want uh, a lot of debt out there. And that's a that's a very good thing. You know, interest rates get more expensive. If you want to pay down some debt. That'll never be a decision that you're you're sorry about. And you may you may curtail a little bit. Uh, maybe you maybe you don't hire as quickly uh, as you did before. But the idea of going all in for a negative economy and just betting the house that things are going to fall apart uh, is is really never been um, a winning strategy. So, yeah. uh yeah. So it's um, I'm curious if you're uh, if you and your students work with the uh, Birkin Road companies. Again, we'll talk about them more uh, in a little bit. Have identified 
two or three of the best decisions these businesses have made uh, in times of fear, in times of pending recession. Uh, it, did they did they staff up? Did they pay down debt? Did they invest double in advertising or marketing or something like that? That there's almost a formula when a business sees recession coming and they know their competitors are likely on their heels. If you can do these three things or these one this one thing, you're likely going to come out of the recession well ahead of what you did uh, you were previously. Is there any such equation like that? Oh, I, I think there is. If you look at companies that have uh, done well coming back out the other side, it's um, even if they've pulled in their horns uh, on the on the outside, they're using that time to restructure the company, uh, do the things they've always wanted to do that you can't really do when you're going full bore. Yeah. You know, it's like, you know, trying to change the oil while the car is driving. You, so um, if you can do that, if you can look at efficiencies, if you can look at uh, um maybe changing the uh, good time to visit a bank, for instance, your bank and, and all of that. Um, that's what has to happen. A lot of things uh, happen is uh, uh, innovation and technology happen more on uh, downsides of the economy than they ever happen on bulls on the bullish side of the economy. So um, just to take a deep breath, the other thing that we find, which Kim is, <laughs> I mean, it's sort of funny is when they interview CEOs, um, uh, they are always, they tend right now to be saying, Oh, you know, we're really worried. And, you know, when we're, you know, concerned and, and all this, but if you look at what they do versus what they say, they are hiring like crazy. Yeah. They are raising dividends. They're buying back their own stock. I mean, it's, you know, what does it do as I do? Not as I say. So, um, I'd be very, um, be very careful for what you uh, what you're hearing versus what they're really doing. Yeah, that's an interesting point. It's almost as if they want to mirror what everyone else is saying, but if you look closely, their behavior is completely different than what they're saying. They're doing aggressive things to increase or or to shore up the structure of the organization, to position themselves for when the recession ends to be stronger and be able to achieve more market share. But on face value, they're talking about doom and gloom and 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 stepping back and entrenching, huh? Yeah, and I think you know there's something in the in the the psyche of human beings that you know you you think it's better off to be negative and then it turns out positive than uh, than being positive and it turns out negative. And I think that's what what occurs. Like um, not to get back to the two lane game, right? But the game I but I figured out six or seven ways to do this is um is the um I remember the, the, we were at the conference game and uh, against Central Florida and the guy next to me was I don't know he's like eighty years old and every time. Uh, the other team would like, I don't know, run for a first down. He'd always turn to me and go, yeah, I've seen this movie before, yeah. you know, like, and you, that's the way people live. Yeah. And um, it's, you know, if you look back at history, it hasn't been the, the right thing to do. And of course, the other thing, Cam, that's important is if everybody's negative, that can't be the thing to do. Right. Like, I remember when I, I, uh, and when I first got in this business, um, Back in 1979, it was with an investment firm and I just came out of college and I was 22. And I remember an older guy pulling me aside and saying, uh, who I now think was like 26, but I thought he was an older guy. <laughs> and, he, uh, and he said, remember, if a majority of the people were right, the majority of the people would be rich and they're not. Yeah. And I've always remembered that. So um, it's uh, and it's tough to go against the stream. You know, it's tough to be at a cocktail party or crawfish boil now and be telling people, that this is a good time to invest or right. here's some stocks I like, you know, yeah. but, you know, think about it. Think about this cam. If we were, a, we did the show like a year ago, everybody wanted to be in crypto. Oh my gosh. Was, what a point you're it, making. Yes. Abs, and everybody, you know, so everybody's not right. And, uh, and you know, the stock market, we talk about it, you know, just being up a little bit from the summer or something <laughs> like that. But you know, crypto it, I, I know that I'll make some enemies out there, but it's worthless. Uh -huh. And um, because you, you look at it, Cam, and um, what I want to invest in is I want to buy like an apartment complex because I know I'm going to get rent every month. Or I want to buy some acreage and plant vegetables because I know there'll be a harvest. But in crypto, it's basically just you. There's nothing going on. There's no there there. And the only reason to own it is to speculate and believe that you can sell it to someone else at a higher price. That's 
not investing. That's, you know, that's gambling. Yeah. Yeah. It's an, it's been an amazing story. I, I heard that Michael Lewis, New Orleanian Michael Lewis was following this Bankman Freed guide around for his next book or movie rights or something like that. Um, it's going to be an incredible story to tell. And, uh, people like me who don't quite understand it all, I'm going to sit there in front of the, the screen and go, all right, maybe someone will explain to me what this is all about and then how it uh, collapsed so spectacularly. Oh. The, uh, and, and you know he's um he's a great writer. Oh, and love stuff his storytelling. Things. Absolutely, yeah, great and, guy. Uh, um, and, and I know you've met him, haven't you? You've interviewed yeah, him at sure. the, the book expo that Tulane has done. Yeah, and I uh, got a chance a couple of times to meet him. And you know the thing that amazes me is you know there's guys that can write or women that can write great novels or something like that. He is taking sub- subjects that seem so dry and taking them all the way to their movies. Yes. I mean. Who on earth can do that? I mean, the, the blind side, it was uh, um, all those books about the uh, accelerated trading yep. and the big short. It's it's incredible. So uh, we should uh, hone up our own writing skills. He's, he's made everything interesting. He has, he has made what most people would think. I agree. Dry stuff. Very compelling. I've enjoyed his work and I'm eager for him to get his arms around this story. You know, I have one. Jim, you know what I like is I, I like it when a name sort of means uh, what's going to happen. And the guy's name was Bankman. Fried, he fried the bankman. I think you know, like made off, made off with the money. I think it's a, it's a, there's a, there's a real justice in here. There was the, the the future was right in front of us if we just could have pronounced it correctly. <laughs> That's funny. You know, Peter, the only thing that that, that the, the guy that turned to you at the football game and said, "I've seen this script before." That does apply to the Saints. Only the Saints could beat the division leader and then lose oh. playoff opportunity in the same day. And it's very, oh, very gosh. much. And you look at it and it's a very, you know, they, it, they're going to, you know, close the season out with a bunch of wins. But it was just too late, which is exactly what happened. Uh, happened last year. Yeah, so, yeah, but we're not wearing bags over our heads. I have no. Uh, that is not even in my closet right now. I'm glad to hear that. You're, I'm on the line with Peter Raschuti. Peter is the clinical professor of business administration at Tulane's Freeman School of Business. When we come back from this break, we'll ask Peter to explain to us Birkin Road reports and how we can get involved. You're listening to What's Working. This is Trey Langus with Transworld Business Advisors. You've worked for years to grow and build your business and now you're considering an exit strategy. Selling your business can be intimidating and complex. Let our local team at Transworld Business Advisors help you. We are the largest business brokerage in the world and I will personally and confidentially guide you through this process. I'm Trey Langus. Find me at Transworld Business Advisors or Google my name. I'd like you to meet my new sponsor, Get The Tea. They carry all natural, non-GMO, organic herbal cleansing teas and supplements. They source their ingredients from the purest available. Your health is an investment that's worthwhile, so why wait? I drink their tea each and every day to help keep my digestive system in check. I'm drinking a glass as I record this right now. It comes in three flavors, natural, peppermint, and pomegranate. I'm drinking the peppermint. All of their products are made right here in the USA. Go to... GetTheTea.com and enter code CAM5, that's C-A-M-5, to receive $5 off your first order. That's GetTheTea.com, code CAM5. On the line today with Peter Raschuti, starting off the new year, looking into the future. What's going on out there? Peter and I are talking a little bit about uh, the economy, Jerome Powell's decisions, etc. You're listening to It's Working. We're back from break. Peter, talk to me a little bit about the the energy crisis that we were reading about in the Ukraine that due to the war that the Russians were going to cut the valves or seal the valves of, I think it was natural gas to Europe. Yet, I think I read the other day that gas prices are lower than what they were prior to the war. I mean, that is not anything anyone predicted. How did that happen? No, that's that's absolutely true. Uh, a couple of things have worked in favor of having lower natural gas prices. It's been a um, the weather's been pretty mild over there, which is a a big big factor. You know, it's funny people that trade natural gas. Um, I only half jokingly really 
put a lot of credence on punks upon Phil in the U S to see if it's going to be a long winter. Right. Not. Right. But, um, so we have a lot of very sophisticated methods we're using here. And, uh, but the other thing is the greatest story in energy and that is LNG liquefied natural gas. I mean, these are coming out of uh, a lot of spots now, but basically um, the Texas, Louisiana border, there's these facilities and it is amazing. It has certainly put a dent and made, your uh, gas prices drop a little bit. And what they do is an engineering marvel. They You're drilling for oil in West Virginia or Texas, and, and they you're drilling for oil, but the byproduct is natural gas. And so they have these pipelines, and they take that gas, and they shoot it down to Louisiana and Texas. And when it gets there, they freeze it. They freeze it down to 265 degrees below zero, which is like, like colder than Minnesota. And, right, right. and, uh, and, uh, and it shrinks the natural gas into one six hundredth of its size. One and six they, hundredth. That's remarkable. Yeah, that's why you, it, it's amazing how much they have there. And then when they get it to the, to Europe or Asia, they, um, they can uh, heat it up again and use it. And even if, you know, natural gas prices have dropped over in Europe, it's still, absolutely amazing because you can buy natural gas here for about five dollars a thousand cubic feet and when you ship it over there you're still getting much much higher prices you know 20 yeah. um you know 30 dollars. so it's really it's an engineering marvel but it's really arbitrage and so i just saw um a ship went out the other day and um it's enough natural gas to this is just one ship to heat the homes of uh Oh, 50,000 German families for a year. For a year. So, yeah. And you see, this is like, if you look at the big, big picture, I mean, this is so far a dent, but down the road, it could really, it could really take um, the power away from Russia. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it's just amazing. So uh, um, we'll have to, that, that's the help. The weather's been a little bit of help. Um, I think, um, and I think they're going to get through the winter, you know, and that's going to, that's going to change the course of everything from the war to, uh, uh, to financial markets. And of course, natural gas is a, um, it is a, um, it's the cleanest of the fossil fuels. And, uh, you know, we talk about coal sometimes, you know, it's kind of, it's had quite a resurgence because we're just so low on oil because of the, we're low on fuel because of the, uh, uh, the war. But it's funny. I saw a picture the other day and you talk about, signs like uh, Madoff and uh, different things. It showed the, um, the coal museum in Louisville, Kentucky, that it's now powered by solar. Oh, no kidding. I think that's a, I think that's a sign. So that's uh, a sign of something that's <laughs> quite ironic. Yes. But I think is. what people need to think about in the Gulf coast is um, we are become really everybody. We're not oil states anymore. We're energy states. So, you know, this, the, they're talking about wind farms in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which we'd have a big advantage on because we already have the infrastructure out there from the oil industry and um, hydrogen and uh, sequestering of carbon uh, under the ground. Or uh, this is, if we look at it big picture, now everybody wants to hold on to their part of the pie, but um, the big picture is really pretty exciting. So uh, I think we're, um, that's better than people, uh, people believe as well. I'll tell you something. Here's a Birken Road story that you would maybe not believe. And that is, um, we were visiting with a company called Secor Marine, which is down in Houma, Louisiana. I told the students to meet me there. I said, it's about an hour and a half South of New Orleans. And they're thinking, an hour and a half south of New Orleans, it would be in, you'd be there with redfish. No you know, kidding, but it, you're in 12 really feet is. of water. That's right. Yeah, it's a, I don't, I don't follow Mr. Rishuti anymore. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, but we get down there and uh, we talk to management for like three hours. We, we love, that's what the Birken Road does is we go to visit companies and we talk to management and then we write an investment research report on what we think of the, the company and the stock. And, you know, if they ever want to see, it's all free. It's uh, if you go to Freeman dot two lane uh, slash Birken Road, B-U-R-K-E-N-R-O-A-D um, dot edu. Um, you can see them, see them all there. But the thing about this story, I just can't get over is we're walking on one of the ships and, uh, and they're about somewhere between 180 feet and 220 feet. And they said, after the tour, they said, well, you know, this, uh, this boat is going to be, um, is going to be back, uh, back away from the pier in, in a few days. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, they these two boats are going to block Island off Rhode Island to help with the wind farms. Hmm. 
And I thought, you know, that I think, wow, now there's another use. I mean, there's no activity, very little activity in the Gulf of Mexico. They're just sending the um, sending them up to where the business is, and maybe the energy business is wider than you thought. So uh, I was uh, real excited about that. Yeah, I think this this uh, this energy pricing, uh, the gas prices are falling. Everyone wants to point their fingers at the president when the price gas prices fall or, or right. rise, and then when they fall, everybody seems to be kind of mum about it. But right, and, I know. And, and, and the, Same the, kind of thing. Everybody wants some ne- negative more oh, than yeah, positive. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and blaming it on, you know, this or that. And, uh, and sure, I, yeah. I don't know how many, the, we're off topic. But I don't know how many times I've tried to explain to people, the president has very little to do with gas prices, whether you like <laughs> yes, him or he, not. And, and the right. National Association of Convenience Stores has a wonderful article explaining how gas prices work. And you'll notice none of it is has anything to do with the president. Nevertheless, we can't yeah. get into politics. It's just regardless right, of who's true, in the true. office, there's fingers pointing at him. But these uh, energy prices are generally, from what I see, this is your world, tend to be falling. And I think everybody kind of can feel better about things when they go to the gas pump and they're not, you know, the breath isn't taken away by what it's going to cost to fill up their, you know, their V8 SUV that weighs 7,000 pounds. Um, right, right. Because I'm never really worried about the whole thing personally because uh, the increase in the price of oil because, you know, my car runs on gasoline. Yeah, that's good for <laughs> that's you. Right, yeah. Now, that was yeah, a strategic so, yeah. decision that you made a while back. Really smart, <laughs> really smart. You know what, you know what, Cam, you mentioned about the convenience stores and we used to follow a couple of convenience stores, uh, write reports on them. And when, when oil prices go up or gas prices go up, uh, people tend to go, uh, they feel like, you know, they've been ripped off or they're broke and they don't tend to go into the store. And in the store is really where the margins are, Yeah, you know, getting people to buy a honey bun and a Dr. Pepper. Right, right. It's uh, not the gas. So. <laughs> That's right. When I pull up to a convenience store with my kids in the car, they do not step outside the car and help me pump the gas. They go in and buy stuff. And that's, uh, you know, that's the gold mine that they're looking for, that the convenience store is well, looking for. You know what they got? And we won't promote any one place, but, you know, they in, uh, I guess it's near Fort Morgan. They've got a Bucky's. Oh, yeah. Have you ever been to there? I have. Oh, God, that's. That's uh, we were driving to Dallas and my wife said, I said, we got to stop here. And she goes, well, we don't need anything. I said, well, that's not the point. That's not you know? the point. <laughs> this is yeah. a this is a tourist site that is also that's a retail right. store. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's similar so, yeah. to Harrods. It's L.A.'s lower Alabama's Harrods. As you, <laughs> you said it. I didn't say yeah, it. That's exactly right. <laughs> so, Peter, we've got enough time to explain Birkin Road's Birkin Road report, how your students get involved in it. It's really a great story and has brought you a lot of celebrity in the uh, business uh, business school world. Let's talk. Talk to me quickly about Birkin Road reports. Well, it started 30 years ago, and I was with the assistant state treasurer, and so I was managing all the state's money up in Baton Rouge. And uh, and I saw people, constituents called me looking for information about companies in in the South uh, that just don't get a lot of attention because they're so far from Wall Street. And so we created, so these companies uh, needed coverage. I knew they would say yes to anybody writing a research report. And um and then on the flip side, I had all these students because I was teaching part time at Tulane and then they were real sharp and they needed experience. And so they kind of went together. It was kind of a voila kind of a kind of moment. And we've been doing it for 30 years and we've uh, it's been very good for the students. So 1100 students from the program have gone to work in the investment business. And so and, you know, that really works out because. Uh, the ones that get into the, a good firm, they tend to throw the rope back over and try to help the current students. Yeah. So um, that work that works out. And um, yeah, no. Um, and we have the best, you know, field trips in the free world. We take helicopters, offshore oil well, uh, rigs. We take steel mills. We visit uh, chicken processing plants. And, you know, one of the things that when I mentioned chicken processing plants, that was always our visit to Sanderson Farms, which is in Laurel, Mississippi. And um, if you've never taken, um, you've never been to a chicken processing plant, do take the family. That's a nice outing. I'm sorry. And it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but they were bought out. And that's the thing about these smaller companies. We did 30 years we've been in it and we've had 60 companies bought out. And the real power to that is that when a company gets bought out, it tends to get bought out an average of about 35% premium. So in other words, if the stock was at 20 and somebody wanted to buy them, they would pay, for instance, about $27 for the stock. Right. So it's been a, um, it's really been something. In fact, 
you know, there's, uh, there's, there's even kind of a shortage of these kind of stocks, which is, uh, which is uh, hard to believe, but it's true. Yeah. So you have this great annual conference in that coincides with Jazz Fest in April or May. Yeah, absolutely. This year it's on my birthday, but I do not think people need to bring me anything. I'm a, I'm a 42 regular and a 1633, but there's no need to <laughs> think about that. It's a, uh, it's April 28th at the Ritz Carlton hotel. And if they want to register, it's just that same website, uh, uh, uh freeman.tulane uh, slash birkenroad.edu. And, uh, the companies we will have are pretty amazing. Um, about, I would say the 40 companies we follow, usually about 20%. And this is the CEO and the CFO telling you, about what the outlook is for their company yeah. and their industry and the economy. You know, this, these are people, I mean, you never hear this as a retail investor or an average guy on the street, you don't. And the thing we're most excited about is this year, our keynote speaker is Howard Marks, who is really one of the most important um, uh, investors in the world. In fact, you know, the one line that I always think is that here it is, is that Warren Buffett reads his newsletter. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so he's going to, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be great. And we've had amazing speakers over the time we've had, you know, um, Jim Paulson, we've had Mario Gabelli. It's, uh, I guess these, these folks, you know, we don't pay them or anything. So I think they just like the idea of, you know, trying to help the next generation out. Uh, they feel so that part, that part's really work. One guy got up and told the students that I have a message for you. Don't get in the investment business. Yeah. So lovely. that was, <laughs> yeah. Birkin road reports, folks, if you want to get the link, I'll put it in the show notes to find the podcast, Wonderful. go to, uh, what's com. All of it's free. What, what, what's working cam.com. I'll have the link to the things that Peter has mentioned. Peter, it's always a delight. I appreciate your delight. view of the uh, the economy. I'm encouraged by it and uh, maybe opportunity to get more aggressive myself during this time of uncertainty. Thanks well, again, my man. And well, a year from now, we'll see if that works. We'll see if it works. Yes, we will. Let's hope that it's a <laughs> glorious conversation a year from now. And we're talking about another two-lane victory at a bowl game. Ah, let's do that. All right, Peter. Good talking to you. Thanks very much. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. We'll be back after this break for segment five. You're in business to make money. At United Bank, we're in business to help you manage it. We offer a full line of financial solutions, including business credit cards, business checking, merchant services, and more. We'll work with you to create a bundle of services that fits your business needs. Learn more about how we can help your business grow at unitedbank.com slash cam. Member FDIC, credit card subject to credit approval. Hey, this is Scott Tindall, and when I'm not playing around on the blockchain with digital horses or trying to figure out what's going on with Disney, I'm listening to What's Working with Cam Marson. Now back to the show. Be more aggressive. That's what I heard Peter say when he... When I asked him about advice and what his Birkin Road companies do during times of fear and recession, what do they do? They get more aggressive. They And I thought it was really insightful that they shore up the internal components of their organization during these times of recession so that when the recession is over, you're ready to explode, that your systems are in place, that your gears and levers are oiled, if you will, and greased. So that they can turn quickly when this when the recession ends. We're back, obviously. You're listening to what's working. I'm Kim Marston. Uh, Peter Rashuti is always an interesting guest in that he is entertaining, as you heard. He's from Tulane, which always helps, as I too am a Tulanian. But he offers some non traditional insight and some non traditional uh, ways of thinking about this time of recession. And I liked his idea of get more aggressive. It's one as I started the show, I talked a little bit about my plans for the the show's plans for the year, and I had ideas and I had some confidences that it was time to get more aggressive with the show. And I think that's exactly what we'll do. Following Peter's advice, I'd be a hypocrite to ask for it and not take it. Considering what this show is all about, I think it's time for us, what's working and my team and my supporters and my consultants and all these people, and it's not as many as I make it sound like, it's time for us to double down and see what we can do to grow this show. Any support or ideas or opportunities you have for us, we'd love to hear about them. 
You can find what's working at whatsworkingcam.com. There you'll see the 200, now more than 250 shows that we've recorded, all of which are in the same format, which we're doing here, more or less, talking with these experts, getting their advice, learning about their stories, and then what we, how we can apply them to business. So it's whatsworkingcam.com. Also at that website, you can email me directly. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know uh, your thoughts about the show. If you feel like there's somebody that should be on the show that has some uh, interesting stories to tell, some interesting stories of their own business, advice for people like you and me, I'd love to know about them. Forewarning, though, anything that looks and sounds like an over-the-top promotion of having me on the show so that I can benefit, those don't really go very well in the administrative halls of this organization, which is essentially me. So let me know what you think the show needs. Find us on social media. We still subscribe to that stuff. We post and paste and pin and tweet and whatever that's needed to get your attention to the show and tell you what's going on. Ask you for guest ideas. Ask you for referrals to people that can talk about this stuff. Find us on social media. What's Working is brought to you each week by John Thompson and I on Digital. Check them out. E-Y-E-O-N Digital. John has had a resurgence of interest in his company, and I'm glad for it. He's very, very good at what he does. So uh, call him, but please uh, tell him, as long as Cam's getting his needs met, we'll be happy to work with you, John. You're listening to What's Working. I'm Cam Marston. We'll be back next week. Have a good week, everybody. Everybody.